Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du Fred d'Aster Revoir un latte coère You know what's unpatriotic? Calling your opponents unpatriotic. This week the slur came for U.S. Senator Tammy Duckworth, who's often mentioned at the top tier of Biden's VP picks. But Fox News' Tucker Carlson might have picked on the wrong combat veteran. You're not supposed to criticize Tammy Duckworth in any way because she once served in the military. Most people just ignore her. But when Duckworth does speak in public, you're reminded what a deeply silly and unimpressive person she is. Now, before we get into what so offended Carlson, here's a little bit more about the person he called deeply silly and unimpressive. Duckworth was born in Thailand to an American father, a veteran of World War II, Korea, and Vietnam, and a Chinese Thai mother. By the way, the Duckworth family has served in every American war since the Revolution. As for Tammy Duckworth, she joined ROTC as a graduate student, became a commissioned officer. In 2004, she went to Iraq as one of the first American female combat pilots. Her Black Hawk helicopter was hit by an RPG, and she lost both her legs, along with half the blood in her body. She earned the Purple Heart, among many other medals, and spent more than a year recuperating. But she never let her disability hold her back. This didn't change who I am, she said. But I'm not about to let some guy who got lucky with an RPG decide how to live my life. She became director of the Illinois VA the same year that Tucker Carlson was on Dancing with the Stars, after a career as a conservative writer and co-host of Crossfire. In 2009, Duckworth became assistant secretary of the VA. 2012, she was elected to the House. 2016, the Senate, and went on to become the first U.S. senator to give birth while in office. Got all that? Now, here's what she said that really teed off Tucker. Should statues, for example, of George Washington come down? Well, let me just say that we should start off by having a national dialogue on it. What really struck me about the speech that the president gave at Mount Rushmore was that he spent more time uh, worried about uh, honoring dead Confederates than he did talking about the lives of our America, the 130,000 Americans who lost their lives to COVID-19 or um, by warning Russia off of the bounty they're putting on Americans' heads. To which Tucker replied, Well, it's long been considered out of bounds to question a person's patriotism. The conclusion can't be avoided. These people actually hate America. There's no longer a question about that. In response, the senator tweeted, Does Tucker Carlson want to walk a mile in my legs and then tell me whether or not I love America? This isn't just about whether Tucker Carlson or Donald Trump served and sacrificed for their country the way that Tammy Duckworth did. They didn't. It's about the ugly rush to demonize your political opponents. Carlson did again last night, desperately calling Senator Duckworth a moron, a coward, a fraud, someone who was once injured while serving in the Illinois National Guard and, because irony is dead, a callous hack. He did all this, allegedly, to defend George Washington, whose statues Duckworth never said should be taken down, and for what it's worth, I don't think they should be. But he might want to refer back to Washington's warning that we should guard against the impostures of pretended patriotism. Some folks fearmonger when they don't have facts on their side. And speaking of facts, here's something to ponder if you're wondering just who you can trust in this hailstorm of hate. Fox News' own lawyer argued in federal court three weeks ago that Tucker Carlson's audience doesn't expect him to report the facts. And that's your reality check. 
There's controversy surrounding comments by Tucker Carlson questioning Senator Tammy Duckworth's love for her country. Tammy Duckworth, who lost both of her legs in Iraq after uh, an RPG took down the chopper that she was co-piloting in 2004. She has received a Purple Heart because of that. And Carlson criticized her because he disagrees with her statement that there should be a national conversation about statues. This was Carlson Monday. You're not supposed to criticize Tammy Duckworth in any way because she once served in the military. Most people just ignore her. But when Duckworth does speak in public, you're reminded what a deeply silly and unimpressive person she is. Well, it's long been considered out of bounds to question a person's patriotism. It's a very strong charge, and we try not ever to make it. But in the face of all of this, the conclusion can't be avoided. These people actually hate America. Duckworth responded on Twitter. She said this, does Tucker Carlson want to walk a mile in my legs and then tell me whether or not I love America? Carlson, though, who, look, he never served in the military himself, doubled down last night and attacked the senator again for not accepting an invitation to come on his show. Perflack informed us that before even considering our request, we must first issue a public apology for criticizing Tammy Duckworth. In other words, I will not debate you until first you admit you're completely wrong. Keep in mind, Tammy Duckworth is not a child, at least not technically. She is a sitting United States senator who is often described as a hero. Yet Duckworth is too afraid to defend her own statements on a cable TV show. What a coward. I am joined now by Brandon Friedman, a retired Army infantry officer who served in the 101st Airborne Division in Afghanistan and Iraq, and he worked with Senator Duckworth at the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. He's also the author of the book, The War I Always Wanted. Okay, so you're listening to Tucker Carlson. You've seen now what he said over the course of two days. What's your reaction when you hear him questioning whether Tammy Duckworth loves her country, right? He says that these people hate America and he calls her a coward. Yeah, um, it, it, it's pretty astonishing to hear that from him. But what's, what's amazing about, about uh, Tammy is that uh, her, her family goes all the way back to the very beginning of America. She had two fifth great grandfathers uh, that fought alongside George Washington in the Revolutionary War. Her father was a World War II veteran. Um, she served in Iraq, obviously, and lost both her legs. So. You can disagree with, with Senator Duckworth on policy all you want, uh, but to question her patriotism, I don't, I don't think that's a, a, a really valid critique here. Um, to say that she doesn't love America or question her love of America is, is quite outrageous. Um, it, it, however, it, it's not something that is entirely surprising from someone who is cozied up to Nazi sympathizers as, um, as Tucker has done. Okay, so maybe consider the source with Tucker Carlson. But tell us about Tammy Duckworth, who, who you have worked with, because she's look, she's in the running to be Joe Biden's vice presidential pick. Tell us what it was like to work with her. Tammy, Tammy's great. Um, so it, it, as a person, she's kind. She has a great sense of humor. She's a mom. She's, she's collaborative. She takes feedback from all of her, from, of her employees. Um, she's absolutely great to work with. And when you couple that with um, her unique, one-of-a-kind resume. Um, she's just, she's a really great person. Um, she did a lot of dynamic stuff when I worked with her at the Department of Veterans Affairs. Um, and we accomplished a lot, and most of that was due to her leadership. I want to go back to something that you said about the criticism of Tammy Duckworth, because one of the points that Tucker Carlson made was he said, you're not supposed to criticize Tammy Duckworth in any way because she once served in the military. Um, and look, I, he's kind of setting up this false argument there because he's saying that you're not supposed to criticize Tammy Duckworth in any way. Um, as someone who's a member of a military family, I find myself sometimes explaining to civilians, you can you can criticize veterans, you can take issue with what uh, this person believes, if they're in the military or uh, they served in the military, but when it comes to their service, you really can't. I mean, criticism, they're not inoculated against criticism. It's just sort of this general understanding as Americans that we have of what their service is. You, you I haven't served. You have. Can you speak to me a little bit about what it means for you to put your life on the line in the service of your country, what that has meant for Senator Duckworth as well? 
Yeah, uh, Tammy didn't, yeah, she didn't ask for the Iraq war. Uh, she went when her country called her, as she has answered the call, every, you know, at every step of her adult life. Um, and, and, and that's just what you do when, when you're a, a type of person like that, that, that Tammy is. Um, military families know that. Um, it's something that, that we all did. And it's something that apparently Tucker Carlson just doesn't, doesn't quite understand. It is Thursday, 9 July of 2020, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner the English Bulldog is our snoozing sous chef. And our daily special is Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. A little bit of jambalaya, a little bit of spice in your life. And I know the grits aren't, well, specifically uh, part of well, New Orleans cooking. But I got to tell you, the best grits I've had has been in New Orleans. They make them lovely in South Carolina, too. Don't get me wrong. But I'm just saying, you know, I get to New Orleans a lot more than I used to get to South Carolina. Oh, one other thing. No stock in the grits. It's got to be milk. All right? Come on. What do you think we are? Uncivilized. Okay, speaking of being uncivilized, uh, Donald Trump is still president of the United States. Can you believe this? I mean, they had more uh, scientific awareness during the Dark Ages when they had all those plagues. God, my God. The pump don't work because the vandals took the handle? Yeah, that's because, um, you know, people got tired of getting sick from that well. Uh Uh-huh. Look it up. There's a lot of uh, disjointed history and all of these obscure connections that, well, you just got to keep following them. And we all do, don't we? Okay, speaking of following, the QAnon idiots here in Oregon generally, they're running for office in mass numbers. Well, mass numbers in relative terms, but still. I mean, these these people, I got to tell you, are a little bit more dangerous than the Rajneeshis who took over that town up there in eastern northern Oregon. Oh, my God. You think that was bad with biological warfare, the local sizzler salad bar? Yikes. Yeah, a lot of people uh, uh, cut loose on that one. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So these QAnon people are running for office on the state level. I mean, the, the, the Rajneeshis only took over a town. Yeah, granted, they, you know, did some uh, terrible things in Portland to the U.S. attorney and others investigating them. But um, uh, the QAnon folks is is sort of like a rot from within. Um, And they have some fellow travelers already uh, in office here in the Northwest. Washington State, too. Boy. So I would think we got to make them some sort of weird domestic uh, terrorist uh, outfit as well. I mean, Antifa? I mean, QAnon ostensibly has some sort of leader, whoever that is, you know, Q. Wouldn't it be weird if Q turned out to be like John Voight or somebody like that? Or, I don't know, it could be any one of those... uh, weirdos in Hollywood. What was the group that they were called? The Lincoln Brigade? No, I'm trying to remember. There was a group of secretive right-wingers in Hollywood who were hell-bent on making sure the Jewish cabal wouldn't take over. And that was weird because some of them actually you know, went to synagogue. I don't know. Well, uh, we have a lot of really terrible things going on right now. We have a pandemic. Oh, hey, if you want to get rid of your kids, and when I'm talking like a mobster, like get rid of your kids, send them back to school. Well, the only problem is, is that uh, your kids are going to come back and probably try to get rid of you by bringing whatever it is they caught at school and giving it to you, Grandma, Grandpa. Yeah. I mean, Grandpa Don Corleone, you know, he might fall over in the in the rose garden there. So, and then it's not because of all, you know, well, he did have an underlying condition, didn't he? Weakened heart from being shot multiple times. You know, that, that will happen over a course of a life. So, yeah, you know, you, Donald Col- Don Corleone falls over in the rose garden, playing with his little grandson, too. 
Who brought the virus? Kid went to daycare, kindergarten. First grade, maybe you know, he's a small kid. He's, he, went to, he went to kindergarten. He, he was in first grade, second, probably second grade. Brought the virus back to the compound, and the titular head was no longer. Michael, Michael. <laughs> yeah, I only wish that this guy in the Oval Office right now was competent like Michael. I mean, who who is this guy? I mean, he this person is not depicted in any of the mob movies that I've seen, except, you know, I mean, <laughs> if they were depicted, they didn't last very long. So uh, I guess that says what um, old uh, racist money will get you on the East Coast, apparently. Wow, when you're trying to break into all that old money and all you got is like racist pimp new money. What do you do? Well, first you become a slumlord, get fined the largest fine in HUD history for racial dis- discrimination in housing. And uh, you build your, your career on that in politics. Next thing you know, you're running the free world. Free. Free to do what you want, when you want to do it. And they're still asking for the black guy's college transcripts. Mm-hmm. You can rest assured there's going to be all sorts of stories now that somebody ghost wrote uh, all of Obama's uh, papers and did his tests. You can rest assured that will be the case. Well, I guess maybe Trump will lose that uh, supposed degree at Wharton now. (laughs) I laugh. Oh, why else am I laughing? Um, I did mention this on social media, but I took my mother to a heart specialist yesterday for uh, uh, not a checkup uh, to see if she would actually need some surgery. Uh, they will not be doing it. She did ask them directly. Was it because of her age? <laughs> You're not going to do this because you just expect me to die anyway. So, you know, instead, I'll just have like a weakened heart, a little blockage to my brain. So I have a stroke. My mom's rather direct, I must say. Bless her heart, too. Thank you, Mom. Anyway, uh, they are not going to do it because um, uh, I, I actually think it's good, you know, that she's not as as bad as maybe we thought. And that's a good thing. Anyway, we're at the heart specialist, and there are people coming in, and they're coming in to see the heart specialist, too. And I got to tell you, they're not shy about letting people know that they're maggots, Trump bros, Trump ets, whatever it is. I call them maggots. Maybe that's a, that's the wrong thing to say, but I, I don't care anymore. The deplorables, those types, you know, the ones who wear their guns and let you know <laughs> they're going to get their way and you're not going to say anything about it because they decide what polite conversation is. We're not wearing masks in a medical facility in a state where masks are mandated indoors. In businesses, public, anywhere, indoors. And I have an elderly mom who's already immune compromised. There's other elderly people in there, too. Now, the girls behind the window, or what I like to call the spit screen, did offer masks. No, no. I don't believe in that. So I will say, I'm going to confess on air to you. Okay, I'm not I'm not giving out the actual details, but I did take a few license plates just in case I need to, well, maybe possibly uh trace contact trace whether some idiot was responsible for somebody in my family getting that disease. Like my dear mom. Don't mess with mom. What's on the rest of the menu here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy? Hey, you know that guy that always wore a bow tie until uh, John Stewart called him out on it? Then he didn't wear a bow tie anymore. That guy. You know, the guy who sides with Nazis and whose lawyer argued in court that his viewers don't expect him to report on the facts. 
You know the guy whose great service to America was appearing on Dancing with the Stars? God, I got to tell you, I almost puked. Well, he picked on the wrong wounded and heavily decorated first female combat pilot by calling her a coward, a moron, and that she is someone who hates America. Well, yeah, if you live in Tucker Carlson's Swanson TV Dinner America, you might think that way, wouldn't you? Yes, and he does. On the rest of the menu, the Commerce Department Inspector General is seeking information on two census hirings that are clearly corrupt. Clearly. Wait until we tell you. The TSA has improved coronavirus protection for airport screeners and travelers after a whistleblower complaint. And I bet the whistleblower has been fired and will be hounded for the rest of their lives. And higher education is pushing back as Harvard and MIT sue to block the ICE rule on international students. Well, you know, the Gestapo has to Gestapo, and they're, they're going to Gestapo here, too. After the break, we move to the chef's table, where Facebook suspended a disinformation network tied to staff of Brazil's Bolsonaro. Wow. The guy who's got the virus. And he's gonna, he's going to be the test tube baby for, yeah, bleach. And a Monaco court upheld the dismissal of a case against a prominent art dealer accused of defrauding the Russian oligarch who laundered money through Trump's overpriced Florida oceanfront properties. <laughs> yeah, we tie it all together in a nice little bow tie. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com to the rightish of the page is our chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. Thank you, Kelly. To the leftish of the chat room link at the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com, you will notice our Patreon site. And I'm going to go against the grain here a tad and fill you in on a little bit of news about what's happening on at Patreon. Uh, by law, international law, uh, they are required now to charge taxes for what's known as tangible goods. So uh, I thought that I had uh, adjusted the benefits that we offer so that they wouldn't be considered tangible goods. A one-time gift ostensibly was not supposed to be a tangible good. And a a offer of a benefit that was opted not to be taken, I was led to believe would not be taxed. <laughs> and unfortunately, someone got taxed. So I did dive into the admin settings and essentially uh, we we will not be handing out uh, bumper stickers with the Netroots Radio uh, logos and the ad blocks or even a shout out. We cannot promise a shout out even one time because that might be construed as a tangible good. I, I thought maybe if I said undying gratitude, but then it, it occurred to me if it's undying gratitude, that might be a tangible good. So uh, there are different tiers there in which you might choose to uh, support Netroots Radio and this this uh, little powerhouse of resistance that has been resisting for almost 10 years now. So we thank you for your generosity. And uh, I'm trying to fix the thing on Patreon. And I hope that I have. I am supposed to be speaking with someone at support 
And uh, I don't know if there's anything more that I need to do or can do, but we will fix it. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your generosity. I understand uh, this is to support this little powerhouse of resistance. And we appreciate that. The love that we feel and the gratitude that we have is undying. Truly. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it is so simple. You just go to at Netroots Radio, and that's because Tom takes care of that. And Tom, thank you. Thank you. I, of course, take care of me. And I happen to be at Justice Putnam on Twitter. Fancy that. I post the show notes and links diary. Do we have to call them stories now? You're not going to. You're, you're going to pry this diary out of my cold, well, whatever hands. Okay. Actually, my hands are quite warm. Mm -hmm. Well, I do post whatever it is they call it at Daily Co's now, about 10 minutes before showtime, and then uh, I post those links, that, that that diary, on social media. And uh, that's what you do. And uh, Kelly will get uh, the the Facebook, the Netroots Radio Facebook page uh, posted with that and the podcast later on, which I should mention if you want to follow the show on Twitter, do so at Cookbook West and pick up the podcast by way of Spreaker, Stitcher, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., etc., etc. Of course, that will be posted on the Netroots Radio Twitter feed and the Facebook feed when uh, Kelly does it, because somehow, yeah, I, 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 I'm being serially blocked on Facebook because, well... <laughs> Look at us. We're liberals. We must be silenced. All right. You know what? We better get right into these stories because these patters at the beginning of the show are taking up almost half of the show. But that's the way it goes. We're in a salon. It takes as long as it takes. All right. Okay. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Oh, Metro Shrimp and Grist Thursdays, by the way. It's if. You didn't know. Adrian Sands of the Associated Press brings us this offering. The U.S. Department of Commerce's Inspector General has asked the Census Bureau for information related to the hiring process of two men whose appointment to top positions have drawn sharp criticism. Oh, you haven't heard about this sharp criticism? Well, you will. The Bureau said yesterday, Wednesday... It plans to respond to the request. Well, they better hurry up. Even though Trump is trying to politicize trying. The Census Bureau. God, this guy. This guy. Commerce Department Inspector General Peggy E. Gustafson. Well, she's going to get fired now. Obviously. Sent a letter to Census Bureau Director Stephen Dillingham. Is he an acting guy? Asking for the resumes of Nathaniel Cogley and Adam Korzanuski and requesting other information about their hiring, including documents related to the creation of the new positions at the Bureau and expectations and goals associated with their jobs. Well, the expectation is to get them into some sort of sweetheart plum deal. Put them to work and push out the propaganda that needs to be pushed out and get rid of all the career civil servants who are going to get in the way and they know they will be. Of course, that's what their goals and expectations are in association with the jobs, the positions that were created, especially for these two fellows. Now, Cogley, if you don't know, and you might be reminded because we did talk about this fellow a bit ago, is a political science professor at Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas. You know, one of those five-room block brick buildings that are universities dotted all over Texas. What the hell? <laughs> and he wrote a series of opinion pieces against the impeachment of Trump. Well, he's been named a deputy director for policy. Now, Korzanuski is a former campaign consultant to the pro-Trump YouTube personality known as Joey Salads and has been hired as a senior advisor to the deputy director for policy. 
Wow, a couple of made-up positions. You know, this is kind of like what the mob does. Isn't that weird? The Commerce Department letter also asked for descriptions of the new positions, correspondence, or other documentation regarding the recruitment, interviewing, evaluation, and hiring of the men, and any financial disclosures they have made, including to the Office of Government Ethics. You are obligated to cooperate with this request per department policy, said the letter, which asked for a response by July 20th. And uh, I'd like to know what the land broke over under is on this uh, Inspector General lady getting fired up by the 15th. David Koenig of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The Transportation Security Administration has improved coronavirus protection for airport screeners after a TSA official accused the agency of endangering travelers. The whistleblower's lawyer said yesterday, Wednesday, the changes include requiring screeners to change or sanitize gloves every time they pat down a passenger and to wear face shields around travelers if there aren't plastic barriers between them and the public. You know, I like to call them spit screens because that's what they are. Jay Brainerd, the top TSA official in Kansas, complained last month to a federal whistleblower protection office that TSA did not train staff for the virus pandemic and barred supervisors from giving screeners stockpiled N95 respirators in March when facial coverings such as surgical masks were hard to buy because since they're government workers, Trump doesn't want, you know, to look bad for the election. Brainerd said the TSA eventually made changes in response to COVID-19, including requiring screeners to wear masks, but the measures did not go far enough. A TSA spokesman confirmed that Brainerd met last week with TSA Administrator John Pekosk, but he did not directly address whether the agency changed procedures as a result because they haven't got the permission from Dear Lita or his little, uh, I don't know, gray pence guy there, the guy so, who's so pensive. We believe whistleblowers provide a valuable service to government, said TSA spokesman Carter Langston, while adding that internal feedback comes from many different sources and we listen to all of them. And I should add, track them down and make sure they never work in government again or anywhere. Langston said the TSA has adopted a continuous improvement approach throughout the pandemic. I like that. A continuous improvement approach. The agency said on its website that 997 employees have tested positive for COVID-19 and six have died plus one screening contractor. Do you really want to go flying in one of these viral test tubes? Ew. Ick. If someone says, don't worry, we have wiped down all of these surfaces with an antibacterial uh, solution. I would pull out my antiviral solution and say, here, let me do it again for you. Okay? Antibacterial wipes do not do anything for a virus. Last month, Brainerd filed a complaint against his own agency with the Office of Special Counsel, which ordered TSA's parent agency, the Homeland Security Department, to investigate the claims. DHS sent the matter back to TSA to investigate itself, Brainerd's attorney, Tom Devine, said. One element of the government's response that he found troubling. This is the fastest I've ever seen an agency make changes after a whistleblower complaint, said Devine, an attorney with the Government Accountability Project, which represents whistleblowers. He faulted the agency, however, for not enacting more changes in using protective gear, 
until Brainerd filed a complaint with the special counsel and talked to reporters. Well, we know how Trump feels about anyone who talks to a reporter. Thompson and Colin Binkley of the AP bring us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, Metro Shrimp and Grits Thursdays. Colleges and universities pushed back against the Trump administration's decision to make international students leave the country if they plan on taking classes entirely online this fall, with Harvard University and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology filing a lawsuit to try to block it, and others promising to work with students to keep them on campus. U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement notified colleges on Monday that international students will be forced to leave the U.S. or transfer to another college if their schools operate entirely online this fall. New visas will not be issued to students at those schools and others at universities offering a mix of online and in-person classes, and they will be barred from taking all of their classes online. The guidance says international students won't be exempt even if an outbreak forces their schools online during the fall term. <laughs> Stephen Miller and his little wife Katie are just rubbing their hands in glee. In a statement, the U.S. State Department said that international students are welcome in the U.S. <laughs> we want your money. In fact, your money will stay here, but you got to leave. But the policy provides greater flexibility for non-immigrant students to continue their education in the United States, while also allowing for proper social distancing on open and operating campuses across America. Wow, all this because Trump wants to look like he's a president. The guidance was released the same day Harvard announced it would be keeping its classes online this fall. Harvard says the directive would prevent many of Harvard's 5,000 international students from remaining in the U.S. And do you know how much each of those students pay in out-of-country tuition? My God. Harvard president Lawrence Bacow said the order came without notice and that its cruelty was surpassed only by its recklessness. It appears that it was designed purposely, purposefully to place pressure on colleges and universities to open their on-campus classrooms for in-person instruction this fall without regard to concerns for the health and safety of students, instructors, and others, Bacow said in a statement. This comes at a time when the United States has been setting daily records for the number of new infections with more than 300,000 new cases reported since the first of July. Well, obviously, that's exactly what they're doing. Obviously, it's purposeful. All right, let's get to our break. And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. Yes, you are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. (laughs) 
from a point at sea to the circles of your mind. A new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Scientific American 60 Second Science. I'm Julia Rosen. (laughs) Don't worry about why the chicken crossed the road. The bigger question is whether it'll make it at all. Every year, millions of animals get killed by vehicles in the U.S., but that road risk has dropped because of the COVID pandemic. We're aware of the negative impacts on the economy, um, family relations. I'm sitting in my living room and I don't see as much of my family as I, as I normally would. You know, so there's a lot of negative impacts, but the positive impacts are becoming more clear. And that could really change the discussion after the pandemic, change some of our assumptions about how much driving we should do if we want to protect nature, wildlife, air quality, climate change, and so forth. Fraser Schilling, co-director of the Road Ecology Center at the University of California, Davis. When officials began issuing stay-at-home orders to slow the spread of COVID-19, Schilling and his colleagues quickly realized they were witnessing a novel experiment. What happens when we all start driving way less? The answer is a lot of things, including fewer accidents and lower greenhouse gas emissions from cars. In their latest report, the researchers found that driving less has also led to a dramatic decrease in road kills in three states for which they had long-term data, Idaho, Maine, and California. It's actually the the largest conservation action that the U.S. has ever taken, as far as I'm aware, since creation of the national parks. The team documented about a third fewer collisions with deer, elk, moose, and other large mammals in the four weeks following shutdowns. If such a slowdown persisted for a year, 27,000 large animals would be saved in just those three states. In California, the researchers also look specifically at mountain lions. Some populations in urban areas are at risk of local extinction, and vehicles are one of the top killers. However, in recent months, traffic deaths of mountain lions have dropped by 58 percent, revealing an important clue about how to save them. Well, to keep them from going extinct or to recover them, we need to protect them from traffic. And that means we need to build stuff. We need to put in fencing along highways and crossing structures over the highways. And that's 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 a big deal. People are now returning to the roads as stay-at-home orders are lifted, but Schilling hopes some of the lessons might stick. Yeah, I just think I think we can grow from this and and having less impact on wildlife. Everybody loves wildlife, you know, and if we if we can find a way to not kill them, it seems like everybody can line up behind that. Thanks for listening. For Scientific American 60 Second Science, I'm Julia Rosen. Hi. It's Tom. Could we humbly suggest your donation to NetRootsRadio.com? All we've got to run this 24-hour powerhouse of progressive resistance radio is what comes out of our own wallets. And you, you are our biggest donor. It doesn't take much, $3, $5. Just go to the bottom of our NetRootsRadio.com page and hit our secure donate button. Heck, you can even make a recurring contribution and you'll get a wondiferous pair of Netroots radio stickers for application to your backpack, your bumper sticker, or your banjo. Well, it's up to you which backpack you want to put it on. So donate what you'd like at the bottom of our NetrootsRadio.com's homepage. Because you are our biggest donor. NetrootsRadio.com. Together, we are Resistance Radio. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1918. That was the day that went down in U.S. history as the Great Train Wreck. The wreck occurred at Dutchman's Curve in Nashville, Tennessee. During World War I, the train industry was bustling across the nation. Trains carried troops, as well as workers, to factories to support the war effort. On that fateful morning, the Nashville, Chattanooga, and St. Louis Railway No. 1 train was heading east to Nashville from Memphis. One of the passengers on that train was George Scott. At 18 years old, George was traveling to the DuPont plant to make gunpowder for the war. He was just one of many workers on the train heading to work at the plant. 
the number four train was traveling west. Both of the trains were running late. As the number four train approached Dutchman's Curve, it received an all-clear signal from the signal tower. But then, the tower switched the signal to a red stop warning. It was too late. The train was barreling ahead on a collision course with the number one train. At 7.20 a.m., the two trains collided head-on at a rate of speed between 50 and 60 miles an hour. 101 people were killed. 171 more were injured. It was the deadliest train disaster in U.S. history. The young George Scott recalled the horrible scene, saying, I had to raise up the window, and the glass was falling all over everywhere, and I finally got out of there, and I wandered out past a cornfield, best I can remember, and I run across one of the trainmen lying there. In the aftermath of the tragedy, thousands of people helped in the rescue effort. Today's Labor History in Two brought to you in memory of Carol Hillman, a passionate friend of work and volunteer of the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. I read the news today, oh boy. It's time for Nicole Sandler's What's News from NicoleSandler.com and the Progressive Voices Network. The Supreme Court's term officially comes to a close on Thursday with the court handing down its final three decisions. The two most anticipated cases both deal with Donald Trump's financial records, including his tax returns. We'll update this report as soon as the decisions are announced. On Wednesday, the court handed down two opinions, ruling 7-2 to to uphold a Trump administration rule that lets employers opt out of providing no-cost birth control on moral or religious objections. The Affordable Care Act mandated employers and insurers must provide contraceptives as part of their coverage, but exempted houses of worship. The Trump administration broadened the exception to cover all employers with religious or moral objections. Justices Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Sonia Sotomayor dissented from the ruling, Ginsburg noting that 70 to 126,000 women would lose free access to birth control because of this ruling. The court also threw out two job bias lawsuits brought by teachers against their employers, reaffirming that religious institutions and schools have a First Amendment right to select their employees. These two rulings are a win for conservatives who argue for what they see as religious freedom. Moving on to COVID news, Donald Trump's campaign rally in Tulsa in late June that drew 6,200 participants and large protests likely contributed to a dramatic surge in new coronavirus cases. That from Tulsa City County Health Department Director Dr. Bruce Dart, who said Tulsa County reported 261 confirmed new cases on Monday, a one-day record high, and another 206 cases on Tuesday. By comparison, during the week before the rally, there were 76 cases on Monday and 96 on Tuesday. Although the health department's policy is not to publicly identify individual settings where people may have contracted the virus, Dart said those large gatherings more than likely contributed to the spike. So let's recap Donald Trump's coronavirus response track record. He said coronavirus infections would be minimal in the United States. The pathogen would disappear. Masks should not be required. Hydroxychloroquine as a treatment for the virus would be a game changer. An effective vaccine will be ready this year. Oh, and this one, COVID-19 infections are harmless in 99% of cases. Right. So this week, the Centers for Disease Control issued guidelines for reopening schools. And Donald Trump slammed it, tweeting, I disagree with that CDC on their very tough and expensive guidelines for opening schools. While they want them open, they are asking schools to do very impractical things. I will be meeting with them, followed by three exclamation points. Really? A guy with that track record is telling us when it's safe to send our kids back to school and is overruling the Centers for Disease Control (laughs) recommendations? I don't think so. Oh, Mike Pence actually said the quiet part out loud on Wednesday. We don't want uh, the guidance from CDC to be a reason why schools don't open. Well, we know where their priorities lie. And where are we under Trump's leadership? The total number of coronavirus cases in the United States passed 
three million on Wednesday as officials confirmed a record 60,000 plus new cases over the previous 24 hours. And the national death toll? Well, that's now above 132,000. States in the South and West continue to report spiking new infections. California and Texas both reported more than 10,000 new cases on Wednesday alone. U.S. deaths, which had been trending downward, rose by more than 900 for the second straight day, the highest level since early June. Hospitalizations also have increased in states where infections jumped, including Florida, where 56 intensive care units this week reached capacity, and Arizona, where ICUs are rapidly filling up, too. Infections have risen in 42 of the 50 states over the past two weeks. And in other sickening news... New transcripts from body camera footage filed in court show that George Floyd told Minneapolis police officers that he couldn't breathe at least 27 times before passing out and dying. Video footage of police pinning Floyd to the ground in a knee chokehold, ultimately killing the 46-year-old black man, sparked outrage in weeks of nationwide protests. This story just gets uglier by the day. And finally, remember Lieutenant Colonel Alexander Vindman, who testified about Trump's Ukraine dealings during the impeachment trial? You know, the one who said regarding the United States, here, right matters? Dad, my sitting here today in the U.S. Capitol talking to our elected officials is proof that you made the right decision 40 years ago to leave the Soviet Union and come here to the United States of America in search of a better life for our family. Do not worry. I'll be fine for telling the truth. And why do you have confidence that you can do that and tell your dad not to worry? Congressman, because this is America. This is the country I've served and defended, that all of my brothers have served, and here, right matters. Thank you, sir. Yield back. Yeah, that? Well, apparently not when Donald Trump is in the White House. Vindman's attorney announced on Wednesday that after 21 years in the Army, Alexander Vindman was retiring. He decided to leave due to a, quote, campaign of bullying, intimidation and retaliation spearheaded by the president over Vindman's testimony last year. Vindman believed the backlash would limit his career options in the military. CNN's Jim Shudo explains. He was told that he would need, by senior military officials, a quote-unquote rehabilitative assignment after what would have been his next posting at the Army War College to kind of make up uh, for his testimony, to to resurrect his career. Uh, One senior officer uh, joked to him uh, that he would need to man a radar station in Alaska. Uh, but, But more seriously, he was told that he would no longer be deployable in his area of expertise, which is Eurasia, which of course encompasses Ukraine, the former Soviet Union, Russia, that part of Europe, which was his expertise. In fact, that was the position that he had in the White House as an expert on Ukraine, which, of course, led to his involvement in the Mm -hmm. impeachment inquiry. The president fired Vindman as the National Security Council's top Ukraine expert in February and pushed out his twin brother, an NSC lawyer, too. Secretary of Defense Mark Esper and other Pentagon leaders have said Vindman faced no politically motivated fallout from his testimony. (laughs) Yeah, right. I got the And that's just a bit of what's news for now. I'm Nicole Sandler. If you appreciate these reports and The Nicole Sandler Show, I hope you'll consider making a contribution. My work is 100% listener-supported, and I can't do it without your help. Find out more at NicoleSandler.com, and please click on that Donate button. Thank you for accompanying us here to the Chef's Table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 62 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting a high of nearly the same as yesterday, around 85 to 90. How about that? 
A good deal of sunshine. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. Overnight lows tonight will be in the upper 50s, low 60s, with winds out of the northwest at 10 to 15 miles per hour. And some clouds in the morning tomorrow will give way to mainly sunny skies in the afternoon with highs around 90 or a tad above. Winds out of the northwest at 5 to 10 miles per hour. The confirmed cases of coronavirus in Jackson County of Southern Oregon have increased from 151 to 157. And we are still not tracking deaths. Why is that? Not because our Democratic governor is avoiding it. No, but we have some, well, weirdos. I don't know. Are they QAnon travelers? One wonders. Anyway, grass pollen is still high right outside the window of the mothership here in Rogue River. The air quality index is in the good range for the Rogue River Valley region at 26 parts per million. And that daytime UV index remains very high at 9. Barometric pressure is rising at 30 inches. Visibility is up to 10 miles and relative humidity is at 85%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted. These purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. London is 66 degrees with a rain shower. Paris is 88 and sunny. Rome is 91 and sunny. Kiev is 72 and fair. Kabul is 83 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 82 and mostly cloudy. Tokyo is 73 and cloudy with more uh, advisories for flood and potential deaths. They've been getting deaths in the hundreds from these floods. Sydney, Australia is 56 and cloudy. San Francisco, California is 54 degrees and sunny. And New York, New York is 83 degrees Fahrenheit, mostly cloudy with a heat advisory. And that is weather from around the world brought to you by people's personal weather stations that they purchased. These people planted these purchased personal weather stations somewhere on their property. And these people positively live around the world. Looks like uh, the Supreme Court said that the New York prosecutor can check into uh, Trump's financial records, but with a caveat, and I didn't see what that caveat is. But we will talk about it tomorrow, if it's not already old news. Jack Stubbs and Joseph Men of Reuters bring us this first amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Facebook suspended a, a network of social media accounts it said were used to spread divisive political messages online by employees of Brazilian President Bolsonaro and his two sons. The company said that despite efforts to disguise who was behind the activity, it had found links to the staff of two Brazilian lawmakers, as well as the president and his sons, Eduardo and Flavio. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mais autant quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers C'est 
Right. Anonymous worker bees at Reuters bring us this final amuse bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A Monaco court upheld an earlier ruling dismissing a case against a prominent art dealer accused by a Russian oligarch of fraud and money laundering, lawyers for the art dealer said. Monaco's appeals court in December ordered the closure of a preliminary investigation opened by local authorities into art dealer Eves Bouvier in 2016 in response to a complaint brought by Dmitry Rybolovlev. Rybolovlev. Rybolovlev is a wealthy owner of Monaco's soccer team who in 2008 bought oceanfront front properties in Palm Beach, Florida from Donald Trump. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day. But you do know we will meet up tomorrow for Blue Moon Spirits Friday. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we'll meet up here tomorrow, right here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon appétit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TF, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coer Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Dans mon jardin d'hiver